So third parties are effective when they address the issues they feel the major parties do not address. Some types of third parties are economic protest parties, issue parties, there are some that are ideological, and there are also factional parties. Let's start with the economic protest parties. Economic protest parties galvanize around monetary issues like the coinage of silver, such as the Greenback Labor Party in 1880 and 1884. They wanted the federal government to produce more greenbacks or paper money. In 1892, James Weaver, who ran as the Greenback Labor Party candidate in 1880, he ran as the candidate for the People's or Populist Party. The most well-known Populist Party candidate was William Jennings Bryan, and actually he ran as a Democrat twice before he became the Populist Party's nominee. His main issue was to increase the coinage of silver. The Socialist Party was formed in 1901 and disbanded in 1972, though Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, who vied for the Democratic presidential nomination against Hillary Clinton in the presidential election of 2016, he calls himself a socialist. And socialists emphasize the government-directed equalization of wealth and government control of industry, but many associate socialism with communism. Now, communists are for the abolition of private property, and the fact that the former Soviet Union, the U.S.'s foil during the Cold War, was a communist nation ensured that it was not going to be a popular idea here in the United States. The most famous member of the Socialist Party was Eugene V. Debs. He ran for president four times, though he failed to win any electoral college votes. Another ideological party example includes the Libertarian Party which believes in less government involvement in the day-to-day -day lives of individuals. Issue parties tend to focus on one topic and their success is usually short-lived. In 1912, Republicans refused to give the nomination to former President Theodore Roosevelt, so he and his supporters formed the Bull Moose Party. This is an example of a splinter party because it splintered the Republican vote, handing the presidency to the Democrat Woodrow Wilson. The weakening of political parties is most often associated with progressive era reforms. Prohibition, the 18th Amendment ratified in 1919 and repealed by the 21st Amendment in 1933, is one such example of a progressive era reform. And the Prohibition Party didn't last very long. Factional parties are parties that tend to break away from other parties and tend to center on one individual. Other parties tend to center on an individual who has left a major party. In 1948, Strom Thurmond opposed Harry Truman's nomination for the Democratic Party and formed the States Rights Party, known as the Dixiecrats. They were for states' rights and for the segregation of the races. They won four states in the South, but Truman still won this, the presidency. Even if the two parties even in the two-party system, it is difficult to beat the incumbent. The incumbent is the one who holds office. This is true of both Congress and the President. In fact, in the past 30 years, the single most important variable in determining the outcome of an election for a major member of the House of Representatives has been incumbency. In 1992, Ross Perot was a relatively successful third-party candidate for president. He ran on an anti-incumbency platform promising to pay down the federal debt. He garnered 19 million votes, but he did not win the election. No third-party candidate has ever won a presidential election. But to return to the point that it is difficult to beat the incumbent, why is that? First, incumbents are well known. They have name recognition and voting records. The media is more likely to interview them because they have advertised their name over several elections and have voted on legislation affecting the state or district. Incumbents also have won election before, which increases the odds that political action committees and interest groups will give them money. Most interest groups will not give money to a candidate destined to lose. Incumbents also have franking privileges. This is essentially a stance that allow them a limited amount of free mail to communicate with the voters in their district to update these voters on key issues. These mailings may not be sent in the months up to an election, but they do give congressmen additional ways to reach their voters and develop a long-term relationship. The incumbent does not have to build new organizations from the ground up. 
Incumbents will have more money in their war chest than most challengers, and they often begin raising this money as soon as they take office. Another incumbent advantage is gerrymandering, the drawing of district lines to try to guarantee a desired electoral outcome. Every 10 years, following the U.S. Census, the number of House of Representatives members allotted to each state is determined based on a state's population. If a state gains or loses seats in the House, the state must redraw districts to ensure each district has an equal number of citizens. If the district is drawn to ensure that it includes a major majority of Democratic or Republican Party members within its boundaries, for instance, then candidates from those parties will have an advantage. This practice was declared unlawful by the Supreme Court in 1986, but did not officially define the word gerrymandering. In 2004, the Supreme Court declined to get involved in a gerrymandering case. Gerrymandering helps local legislative candidates and members of the House of Representatives who win re-election over 90% of the time. After the 2010 census, gerrymandering took place based on sophisticated computer programs. These computer programs knew even what publications people in individual homes were reading and what they were buying on the internet and matched that information up with likely party affiliation. So we, now we have this crazy district map that doesn't follow any logical geographic boundaries or landmarks, really, one that cuts streets into pieces, requiring neighbors to vote in different districts. Be sure to read thoroughly your textbook and look over this video and do all the questions.